Hi, my name is Steve Rahi. I am a Premier Field Engineer specializing in System Center Technologies. Today's discussion will be part eight of an ongoing discussion dealing with uh, Operating System Deployment and Configuration Manager 2012. In part eight, we will specifically talk about Pixie and understanding Pixie. So as we get started, uh, here's the agenda, by the way, as we get started, uh, should really point out, it should be pretty well known, I would, I would guess, but point out that Pixie is not something that is specific to Config Manager. It is a mechanism that Config Manager can leverage in order to, uh, in order to provide Pixie Boot services and image deployment through Pixie Boot, but Pixie Boot strictly is, is a kind of technology external. You know, I kind of think of it, uh, and I might mention this again later, but I kind of think of it as uh, the way Config Manager implements software updates. We have a software update point, but the underlying technology really is WSUS, right? We leverage WSUS to drive that software update point and uh, so on, right? Well, in a similar way, we leverage Windows Deployment Services, WDS, to provide our Pixie services, and then we tap into image deployment through that technology, right? More on that uh, in a minute. So here's the here's the agenda, right? What is uh, Windows Deployment Services? Basically, uh, talk about Pixie, um, configuring Pixie, boot process. You can read it and so on, right? So let's let's dig into this. And most of this session, we'll do some demo for sure. We'll talk about some things, uh, but this is really just to try to explain how Pixie hooks in, give kind of an end-to-end -end discussion of how that works and so on. Okay, so let's start basic, right? What is Windows Deployment Services? Uh, frankly speaking, you know, pretty easy definition. Windows Deployment Services is a piece of technology in Windows that allows us to remotely deploy operating systems, right? It is a way to take an oper a system, a computer that has no operating system, colloquially called bare metal, right, and deliver an operating system to it. So WDS, Windows Deployment Services, uh, had a predecessor. It was called RIS, Remote Installation Services. Essentially the same thing. WDS has uh, definitely some tweaks and bells and whistles that RIS didn't and, uh, and so on, but it, it was essentially the same thing, right? Now, what about installing Windows Deployment Services, right? There's two ways to do it. You can install Windows Deployment Services by itself, then you can deploy, uh, install Windows Deployment Services for Config Manager. Well, let's talk about the differences. So I'm going to pull in my lab here to show that. Now, what I'm going to use is a system that uh, I don't have WDS on right now. Uh, I don't really want to have WDS on it, but I will just for the purposes of showing this. Right. So the way you install WDS is to go to uh, the um, roles, and roles and features and install it. Right. So uh, next and just select WDS down here, add the features, move on, that's really it. So now we get to this page though. So when you install WDS, you have two other optional components or two other components you can load. If you're going to install full WDS, you will load both. If you're going to install WDS for Config Manager, we don't require both. It's been a while since I've looked, but as memory serves, we only require the transport server, right? But we'll go ahead and install both for now. So we're going to let this run, and uh, while this is running, let's talk about this, right? So here we're installing WDS, assuming it's going to be standalone. Really, the way you install WDS is identical, whether you're doing standalone WDS without Config Manager or you're going to actually leverage WDS with Config Manager and, uh, and let Config Manager deliver the images. So we're finished here, so I'll close that, right? So the difference is, if you plan to use WDS for Config Manager's Pixie services, uh, or to provide Pixie services to Config Manager, then after you do the install like we just did, you don't need to do anything else. There is no configuration necessary, right? Going back to that software update point example, uh, WSUS kind of thing, it's the same thing, right? So WSUS has the binaries and the platform and so on that we need and the software update point lays on top and kind of gives directions. In a similar, not exactly the same, you know, the technology is different, but in a, same, a similar way, like I said before, WDS provides the binaries and the uh, Config Manager Pixie uh, install lays on top of WDS and, and tells WDS how to hook into uh, Config Manager, right? Or, or configures WDS to hook into Config Manager. So now that we've got it s installed, so we have WDS over here, 
right? And uh, we can go in here and look at it. We can also go uh, up here, if my mouse will cooperate. Oops, here, there, finally. So look at Windows Deployment Services right here. And you'll notice it just pops up uh, an MMC-like uh, like console here in just a second. And uh, you'll notice that it's not configured, again, because it does not need to be, right? So uh, if you want to work through and validate that uh, WDS is installed and, and kind of understand that structure a little bit, come on, console. Make sure I had that right. Well, it looks to be hanging now for a minute, but that's okay. Um, we'll let that console come up and then we'll continue our discussion. There it was. All right, cool. So um, if I go under servers, you'll see the server that I have. You'll see the yellow exclamation mark that it's not configured. I could go in and, and configure it, right? If I wanted to configure server, uh, take me through a wizard to do that. Don't need to, though. There is no requirement at all, right? So to prove that, I will connect over to my server that is the WDS server for this environment for Config Manager. So that is uh, a WSUS server or a, a WDS server, right? So it is there. It is configured, but notice it is only configured, I guess you really can't tell, it, it's only configured by the fact that uh, Config Manager finished the necessary stuff. There's no boot images. There's no install images listed here. There's none of this stuff. There's no uh, drivers at all, right? Nothing in here. So it's really not configured, although the service now is running. That's the main thing, right? So, but it's not configured like you would expect a WDS server to be configured. So we'll, we'll put a pause there. We're not interested in uh, WDS further configuring it for standalone. We're interested in WDS providing Pixie services to Config Manager. So let's follow on with the configuration of uh, WDS and understand it, right? So a sign that uh, WDS is installed is there will be a remote install folder. It won't always be at the root of C. In my case, it is because I only have one drive. Could be elsewhere. But as we look in this, there are some folders here. There could be more too, depending on how you uh, how you implemented WDS and upgrade scenarios and, and things like that, right? Um, in fact, there is a, a nice article that talks about the structure of WDS. Uh, it is, I believe, yeah, right here. This is a, a good link to it on the, the PowerPoint, but let me uh, show this to you just real quick. So if I can pop up Internet Explorer here. Oops, had too much in there, looks like. Yeah, I had the bullet. I don't need the bullet in there. There we go. So uh, pop up here and, uh, and we should see you know, this article. So it has a nice detail of the remote install folder. It has nice detail of WDS if you want to explore that. But basically uh, here, you know, some of the folders like uh, uh, boot, as an example, is going to contain the boot images for a system. Or, and let's explain that. So in order for a system to image through Pixie, it has to be able to boot and get an IP address and you know all of those kinds of things. So uh, WDS provides the ability uh, to boot a bare metal system by providing files and so on, right? There's going to be an images folder. And this ultimately will contain the images that are available to install on the system that is booting, right? You would think of this as a full operating system image that you might want to deploy to a system. Now, hold that in the back of your mind. Whenever we get to the config manager configured system, you're going to see that it's a little bit different than that, right? So let's continue on, right? So uh, another you know, folder would be uh, management is going to contain your device drivers, uh, database, and, and so on. Uh, other folders in here, like uh, templates, will be uh, for unattended setup, and then we'll have our temp folder here. Now, that's something we'll talk about in the troubleshooting uh, discussion a little bit later, but uh, the temp files kind of work the same 
for standalone WDS as config manager WDS, and then some WDS client under 10 files and so on, right? So that's, that's the structure of the install. Now, there's, uh, on the file system anyway, some, some indicators of what's there. Now, uh, there's also, like many uh, products, there's registry components that indicate that this thing is installed. So a couple that we'll look at. So if you go under Software Microsoft, and then WDS, right? This is the folder structure for WDS. It's nothing that I want to explore really here, but it's at least interesting to know it's there. And then under um, system, I want to spend a little, uh, or show this as well, current control set, uh, services, and then WDS, right? WDS server is down here. So if we expand this, right, uh, we'll see some detail about it and, and so on. Now, one of the things that I want to explain, because this is fundamental to the structure of WDS, if we look under here, you will see a folder called providers. So a WDS provider is kind of like the name implies. It is a component that provides service through WDS. Now, by default, there's only the standard WDS providers, right? Uh, just these things, and you can see WDS Pixie down here, right? Just the standard list of providers. But if we to look at this, this is on the standalone WDS server that I just installed. But if I connect to my remote uh, system that is acting as a config manager WDS server, we see that there's additional stuff here. Let me do that real quick. So I'm going to connect my network registry. All right and go to local machine. And this, this system, by the way, is my primary site, right? A WDS server, uh, Pixie, distribution point, whatever, can only be installed at a primary site in a hierarchy, uh, or in ever, right? Because in, without a hierarchy, you won't have a CAS. Um, system, current control set, services. And here we are, oops, I didn't go down far enough. WDS server, right here. So let's expand the same thing. And if we go down to providers, and then again, WDS Pixie and providers, we see now there's actually an additional provider, right? The provider for Config Manager. So the way these providers work, you could have, you know, one, which is the standard WDS. You could have two, which is the standard WDS plus SMS provider. You can have a third, fourth, however many providers don't know, right? The point of these is these providers kind of go in order. There's a... Uh, an order in which we will try them. So, you know, if we get a Pixie request, we'll have the first provider try to answer that, the default WDS provider maybe, try to answer that request. And then uh, if it cannot fulfill the request, then it will pass it on to the second provider, maybe the SMS uh, Pixie provider or whatever. And uh, then, you know, we'll go on, uh, go on from there, right? And here's where we specify the provider order. So in a system that is configured, for config manager integration, we're going to put our provider first because we expect that we will always want to answer that request first. And then here's the second one. If you had multiples, you'd have them loaded out over here, right? But that's how it works, right? Structurally. And by doing that, that's how, you know, sometimes you wonder how does config manager intercept the call and know how to handle it? That's how. We have a provider there and, uh, and so on, right? All right. So um, having talked about all of this so far uh, and mentioned the word Pixie and all of that, probably most of us understand what Pixie is and how Pixie delivers the ability to boot a system that is bare metal uh, and over the network, right, without a CD-ROM drive or whatever. But let's just walk through it to show, right? So here, notice, I'm just going to start this machine up. It is bare metal. Start it up. And immediately, because the BIOS boot order tells it to try the NIC first, we're going to go into a, an attempt to Pixie boot. That's exactly what's going on. We're trying to reach out to the DHCP server. I'm going to pause it there. And you notice that I immediately go into a TFTP download, right? This is my boot media uh, that, or my boot uh, scenario that's coming from my WDS server, okay? Now, uh, we'll dig into this in just a minute. In my case... The boot just happens. You'll explain. You'll, you'll understand why as I move on. There is no requirement for the 
user to input into that boot process. Typically, you would as a user, right? Uh, you would need to invoke the Pixie boot by pressing F12, right? I, I'll give you a preview and I'll say it again. The reason that you don't have to press F12 right now in my lab, right, is because I have an image that is required to this machine, is targeted to this machine. And when you have an image that is required, there is no delay. We just start loading that image, right? Again, that's something we'll talk about again later, but that's the difference. If you don't have an image that is required, but the system does find one, then the user can press F12 to go ahead and proceed with that, right? And as you saw, you know, up here, uh, there was, uh, we, we already passed it now, but there was a DHCP request that was going on. Uh, here's the DHCP IP that we got back, right, and so on. That's actually the DHCP server. Uh, here's the client IP we got back, and so on. So there is absolutely a DHCP tie-in uh, that we need to uh, need to know about as we go through this. All right. So let's uh, let's move on. Then. So I'm going to go ahead and close this because don't need to uh, to keep it. Let me just turn this off. Turn off. All right. Good enough. We'll come back to that later. And let's pull the lab out and keep going in this discussion for a little bit. All right. So that's what we just did. Uh, now, in terms of configuring Pixie want to go through and talk about how we do that. And now we're, we're all of this session is Config Manager focused. We are going to stay Config Manager focused. That standalone Pixie discussion was simply that to discuss it and talk about it. Everything we care about, though, is Config Manager integrated. So what, um, what we can do is, let's go through these, right? Uh, Pixie and distribution points, Pixie options, all these different things, right? I'll, most of these are easier to show in demo, so let's just go ahead and pull the lab back in. Now, this lab that uh, I have a number of machines here in my lab. Let me pull this one in. This is one that I don't have configured at all for uh, for Pixie services, so it's a good one to use to show. Right, this is one of my other Config Manager servers, so let's pull up the console. So, and and let's look at our our uh, server here. So this is my primary site. Here's my distribution point, and if I look at it. Pixie is now tucked under our distribution point. You see, this is not enabled at all, right? So if I enable this, then uh, I will get this pop-up, right? Let's talk about that. And by the way, you can just as easily install Pixie on a traditional distribution point as you can on a pull distribution point. Both can support Pixie services, right? Um, in fact, to, uh, to show that, let me just say no and cancel this. To show that, this is a traditional distribution point. This is a pull distribution point. You'll see it here. Uh, PD stands for pull distribution point, uh, in my naming anyway. Go to properties on this, and you'll see um, here there's a Pixie tab, right? Uh, so I can go ahead and, and configure that. Here's the pull distribution point tab so that you know it is a pull distribution point. So we can as easily configure Pixie on a pull DP as you can on a standard. Right, so let's just use this for our discussion. So and when I click Enable Pixie, right, there's a pop-up here that says, hey, you know, be aware, if you happen to be uh, co-locating this Pixie point on a DHCP server, then there are some port adjustments, or some uh, DHCP options anyway, that you're going to have to uh, deal with, and, and port stuff that you're going to have to deal with, right? Uh, typically, in a lab, maybe you might have uh, Pixie co-located on a DHCP server. It's not common. In fact, I wouldn't do it. Even in my lab, I don't do it, just for convenience sake. But at least this tells you about that, right? Um, so we can say, yes, you know, that's fine or, or uh, whatever. So, yeah, I do want to uh, do that, right? And then uh, other things that we have in here. So uh, whether or not we want to allow this distribution point to... Uh, respond to in incoming requests. Why would I not want it to respond to incoming requests? Well, maybe because you're in maintenance, right? So certainly if it's a production Pixie server, you're going to want it to uh, respond to requests. But if you're going into maintenance or the server is having a problem, you can turn that off, right? And by the way, big tangent here, why do I keep calling this a Pixie point? It's habit, right? It really is a distribution point enabled for Pixie, 
but I call it a pixie point. The reason why is in Config Manager 2007, the pixie service or the pixie component was not under the distribution point. It was a standalone thing. So you would install the site system role called a pixie point, right? And that's why I keep calling it that. But it, it really is uh, a distribution point enabled for pixie, right? Uh, probably self-explanatory, but there we go. So yes, we want to allow this to install to uh, respond to incoming Pixie requests. Now, whether we enable unknown computer support. You can absolutely enable unknown computer support um, through Pixie, but as you uh, get the pop-up here, it's dangerous, right? It can cause problems if you don't know what you're doing. So I'll say this again, but one of the things, and I turn this off, right? One of the things that I strongly urge is before you enable any of these things that cause images to just load without a delay, know what you're doing. You need to know this process first. You'll hear me say that again, right? I'll tell you a story. So um, years ago, whenever I was testing uh, Pixie for the first time in my lab, uh, my lab was on my, uh, my, on my corporate network where, frankly, it shouldn't have been. And I thought, well, I'll just turn this on for 10 minutes to do this quick test, uh, my Pixie point, whatever. No one's going to be affected by it. Little did I know that one of my colleagues was rebooting. And little did I know that their machine was set with Pixie boot in the boot order first or whatever. So they walked over and asked me, hey, Steve, are you, uh, are you doing anything that would cause me to uh, get a Pixie response? You know, because it comes up with a config manager screen. I'm like, well, yes, yes, I am. And fortunately for my uh, colleague and for me, I had not enabled my uh, system to force deliver, to uh, require the deployment of an image. If I had, their system would have been deleted. Right, and just like you saw in the pop-up, you know, unknown systems, those that aren't in the database, if you turn on unknown support, we're just going to blow down any image that is deployed to the unknown computers collection, which again, you can do if you really need to and you know how you're doing it, but it is a risk. Whether or not you want to require a password, this might be something you want to do on your Pixie service, right? It's another level of protection that if you Pixie boot, you have to type in a password to move on, right? In my case, I don't care. Uh, whether this user device affinity, not really specific to Pixie, is just here, so I won't talk about it. Network interfaces, so whether I want to respond to Pixie on all of my NICs or specific ones in my lab, certainly there's only one NIC, so yes, I want to respond there, but in production, there might be four or five NICs on a computer, and uh, you might not want to respond on all of them. Maybe there's some that are just on your internal network or whatever, so you don't uh, need to factor those in, right? And then finally, this one. Specify the Pixie server response delay, and we set it to zero. So this one responds immediately. So the question is, why would we want a Pixie server to delay the response, right? And the answer is that you might have other systems in your environment that are able to deliver Pixie services. And in those cases, you might want them to have the opportunity to deliver those Pixie services first, right? Um, as an example, you know, maybe you have uh, a Linux-based uh, server that deals with um, deals with deploying images to Linux systems that will bare metal boot, right? If they don't get a response from the Linux server or the, the Linux uh, Pixie uh, system, then you might want to fail over and let window, you know, Windows build it or Config Manager build it, whatever, right? That's one scenario. There could be others. But this allows you to basically say, I'm going to wait. Or it could be that you have multiple Pixie servers and you want the one, you know, one primary one to respond first. And then these are backups, right? And so you have them kind of staggered out, even within the config manager environment. You know, one of them responds first and the others kind of are fail safe or whatever, right? There's multiple examples uh, for that. But that's, that's what, what that is for, right? Okay. So, um, now that this is here, right, then we, you know, now that we see where we set this up and how we configure Pixie and what all that is, once we hit OK, uh, then we will go through and begin the process of configuring Pixie. In fact, let me, let me cancel this because I want to show you.
uh, this is back on my uh, main one, the server that I'm on uh, right now, the uh, one that I want to install it on. So if I go to my distribution point and I just simply say enable Pixie here, yeah, yeah, uh, not going to require a password and I'm going to hit OK. Now when I do that, we're going to go off and begin to try to configure Pixie right, on that distribution point. So how do we follow that? How do we trace that? Right? Well, uh, obviously, you know, based on our previous discussion, WDS would need to be installed first. It's not installed in this server, so it's not going to be a successful install of Pixie. But nevertheless, um, if we were doing this for real, you'd need WDS on there. Uh, after that, we would install the Pixie point through our distribution point properties page. So once you hit yes, go, for the Pixie, Pixie install, where do you track that? How do you know that it was successful? So in Configuration Manager 2007, because there was a separate Pixie point, we had uh, two logs we could track it in. There was one called Pixie Setup.log and one called Pixie MSI.log, right? Very similar to, you know, what we have even today with the Management Point or Software Update Point logs and things like that for setup. Because it's now tucked under um, our distribution point, we no longer have those Pixie setup logs and things like that, but we do it in Distribution Manager. So let's go over to that system. And look, right, so if we go under the Config Manager folder and look under Logs and Dist, Dist Manager, there we go. So we should, by now, see some information about trying to install a Pixie point or enable the Pixie point, right? So we'll just go to the bottom and uh, search up, right? Okay, so we're even seeing it now, it just happened. So WDS server status, WDS server started. Notice we didn't have to configure it, distribution manager starts it, right? So I can just search up, I'll search up for Pixie and you'll see where we go and begin this, right? So Pixie register has succeeded. Here we're going to do Pixie provider registering Pixie, all of these things, right? So I won't belabor this, no real interest uh, or need to go through this process in the log because it's going to fail because we don't really have uh, what we need uh, to set this up, right? But that's where you track it. So just for knowledge, that's where you set it all up. So I'm going to go ahead and turn this one back off because I don't want to keep it. Good enough. Yes, I do. Okay. Cool. Now, so then the question is, let me pull this out and go to my system that actually is the Pixie point I want to track for the rest of this. So let me pull in my um, primary site, which is here. So this is the Pixie point for the rest of the discussion. <clears throat> so the question is, now that we've got WDS installed, now that we have the Pixie point installed, what changes are made to the remote install folder because of the config manager Pixie point uh, being set up or the, the Pixie distribution point changes, right? So if we go to the remote install folder, we'll see a few. So we have the boot folder that we talked about. These are the boot files that enable booting of that bare metal device. Same thing here. We have some additional files that enable uh, these kind of things. You'll see you know, these kind of being referenced when we Pixie boot and so on, right? So, um, uh, cool. Just pulling in that screen again. So, uh, if you notice, just to point out, right? So, the TFTP download is coming from SMS boot x64 Pixie boot dot n12. Well, if you look, I was in the x86, but if I go to the x64, there is a file there, right? So, that's what I'm talking about. These are the uh, files that provide Pixie service, right? So then we have another one there, uh, SMS images. Now notice this. So I told you that the images folder is where you would deliver the operating system image that you would want to apply to the machine. It's true. But in the case of SMS images, we don't want to do that. What we want to do instead is provide our boot image, right? The whole point of imaging is to get into, or o, uh, OSD, is to get into Windows PE so that we can connect with the Config Manager infrastructure uh, for an online build and then select the task sequence we want and start the process. So in our case, instead of delivering a full image, 
we're gonna, just going to deliver the um, uh, pix the Windows uh, PE part, the boot image that can then be used to get into the environment. Right? Here's our SMS temp folders. So uh, this is the same kind of structure as you saw earlier. Right? And then uh, SMS temp boot file. So uh, basically, we carve out our own space on WDS to allow us uh, room to move and do what we need to whenever the config manager WDS provider intercepts the call and attempts to uh, build a system. All right. So one other thing in the configuration here, this is not a config manager specific thing, it is a WDS thing, but one of the, uh, so I've mentioned a couple of times that the Pixie boot uh, can be a little bit dangerous in some situations. I don't want to say dangerous. It can it can lead to unintended results in some situations if you don't have it configured properly, right? The unknown machine booting up and, and you know, the scenario I described with my colleague where they pixie booted and got into my infrastructure, right? So uh, the fail safes, there are a number, you know, like we talked about having a password on there, not enabling unknown computer support uh, in that kind of thing. So in the registry, there's also... Uh, the ability to make a change. So this opened up to uh, where we just were. If we go in and uh, edit the registry under WDS server, right, and providers here, uh, there is the ability on the WDS Pixie itself to add a key or an add an entry, right? So this entry is not here by default, but it's one you can add. So if we want to add a new value, we would want to add a multi-string value of this kind. So what we would want to add is this thing called band GUIDs, All right? So if we add that, it is reg multi SZ, then what we can do is come in here and edit all or enter all of the GUIDs of the machine that we don't want to ever pixie boot. And so if one of those machines with that GUID comes in here and tries to pixie boot, it will be rejected and we just won't do it. Now that's not there by default, you can add it, right? So just a brief mention so you know it's there, I'm gonna go ahead and close registry editor, uh, but uh, this is documented right here. It's a good article that talks about how to set that up, right? Okay, so all of that precursor, now let's go start working with this thing, right? So one of the things that sometimes folks ask is, okay, this thing pixie booted, but how does that Pixie boot process work? What is the process when the system Pixie boots? Uh, so one of the ways you can discover that is by doing a network trace. In fact, there's a nice write-up on the Pixie boot process by Symantec at this article here. Right. So let's, let's pull in the environment and let's actually do a Pixie boot and let's see what it looks like. So it, in order to track that, I'm going to pull in my uh, CAS again, the only reason, it's not the CAS that I care about, it's more where DHCP is located, and DHCP happens to be located on my, uh, on my server here, the, uh, it's also the domain controller for this, this little lab, right, so DHCP is there, right, so, um, there we go, all right, so, uh, I actually have one saved off that is a little bit more compact than what we might be able to get here, but I will, uh, I'll try to get it live and then work through it, right? So what we want to trace is the, the request from the machine as it pixie boots and what's going on. So let's load up our analyzer. I'm going to choose the NIC that is in my lab versus the one on the internet. I'm just going to start the trace. And as I do that, I'm going to pull in my system here and turn it off uh, and start it again. Actually, this is going to, be too much clutter here. Let me uh, let me stop it. Let me just close it and redo it. It's probably the easiest thing for me. Yeah, let me just start over. Um, so here's my interface list again. Cool. Start. And as soon as I do that, I'm going to pull in my machine and turn it on. Wait for it to pixie boot, then I will stop this. And good enough. So it went through the process, right? So it got an error, which I'll show you why it was that in a minute. But here we see some of the DHCP requests, the acknowledgments and so on that are going back and forth. Again, a lot of noise here, but at least you see them there in the stream, right? There's some other DHCP requests. Here's one up here. Let me show you more of a condensed uh, 
version of this. So I'm going to quit this. I'm going to open this one that we have saved. So this is a condensed trace, right? So what we care about is figuring out how pieces start to fire. So the process really is whenever the, the system that is a bare metal system boots, it needs an IP address to be able to do anything. So it's going to send a broadcast and ask for an IP address. Well, then once it gets that, uh, it's going to have to find the WDS server. So it'll send another broadcast asking for the WDS server, somewhere it can get Pixie services. And we see that here, right? So we're starting with a machine that is, has no IP address at all, right? It's going to send a DHCP discover. Now our DHCP server, the .10 machine, is going to send back a DHCP offer, right? That offer is accepted. We don't really see that. But then we see machine number 11 respond with another offer, right? It says DHCP and such, but really that's the Pixie server. There is no DHCP services on that at all. It's WDS. So we're getting a response to say, hey, I'm a WDS server, right? You, you've got your IP address. Now I'm the WDS server you can talk to. And then finally, we move on a little bit down and we see that the machine now acknowledges that request. The, uh, the DHCP server acknowledges that the system can build. And so we start to uh, build the system uh, and off we go. Here's the broadcast and, and so on, right? Uh, okay. Yeah, and, and basically we're looking for now who has the IP address 11. So, so that's the whole process, right? So DHCP knows about WDS and we broadcast and so on. So but that, that's a little streamlined little bit of the trace, you know, a little bit more detail as we start to build and so on. But that's how WDS works and boots. And if you want to see, again, more discussion on it, see uh, basically even a more streamlined version of what I just showed you, you can go to that Symantec link and read up on that. Now, there's another part of this, right? The other part of this is when the machine boots, certainly we know we have to get a DHCP address, certainly we know we need to go to the WDS server, but once we go you know, somewhere in that process, we're going to go to the WDS server and we're going to have to find out, is there an image that I have deployed to me, my machine that I'm pixie booting from, and if so, what is it and let me, uh, let me have it and we can start to, to use it, right? That's where that provider comes in that SMS provider we put on. So in WDS in that registry. So whenever we do the Pixie boot, there's actually a handoff through that provider to the system, to the site server, to find out um, you know, whether there's an image or not. In fact, let me pull in the, uh, the, the primary site and we'll, we'll work through that, right? And I'll show that to you. So here's the primary site. And what I want to do um, is, in fact, let me do this thing real quick. I'll explain to you what I'm doing in just a minute. Get rid of that. All right, cool. So what I want to do is set up so that I can watch the uh, the boot happen and the request happen, right? So one thing I'm going to pull up is Profiler. There. There's two places I'll look to find out and trace what's happening. Let Profiler load here. All right, there we go. So I'm going to start a new trace. And I don't care at all about some of this noise. Don't care. Let's see. Good enough. I'm going to let this run because I can search for what I want in just a minute. So I'll minimize this. All right. So let's go ahead. And I'm going to restart this. And this time we'll get another Pixie boot. And it will work. Right. So I'll just go ahead and stop it after it starts to, uh, to build. Good enough. So I'm done now. I'll go ahead and turn it off. All right. Wait for it. Wait for it. There we go. So it just started to build. I don't care. Now I can move this out of the way. So what I want to do is trace and see how that happens. So we know it goes to the WDS server, and then we know it's going to connect in and ask for information in the config manager uh, environment, right? Well, so let's follow that, right? So I have profiler. I'm going to go ahead and stop it. Um, I'm trying to think how I want to present this. Okay, so I'll just, I'll just talk about these things separately. So when uh, the WDS service is hit, we're going to go into the Config Manager infrastructure and try to find out what the information is that we have. So let's look at that. So I've got a lot of stuff here. I could sort through it. If I don't know what to look for, then I can certainly line things up with timestamps and things like that. In this case, I know what to look for. Uh, 
So I'll just find it, right? So NBS stands for Network Boot Service, and that is the, uh, the prefix of the stored procedures we use as we get into the environment, right? So here is a lookup Pixie device that we uh, are sending in. Notice we have the uh, UUID and the MAC address, right? So those are the two required uh, pieces of information to be able to look up a device. If you don't have the MAC address, then we'll use the UUID. If you don't have the UUID, we will use the MAC address. If you don't have either, we won't find the device, right? And there can be some interesting scenarios with this. So if you have a system that has a duplicated MAC, then you can get unexpected results. You should never have a duplicated MAC, though it can happen, right? In uh, the past, I've seen it, you know, back in the, the time when we had the dial-up adapter on Windows, uh, all of the dial-up adapters had a shared MAC, right? Now, we didn't really care about that for OSD, but that's an example where you can get a shared MAC. Uh, other examples I've seen uh, where we have dongles that we're building uh, maybe tablets with, and that dongle is transporting between machines, then that dongle has a unique MAC, and the machines will inherit it and have it, right? They'll have their other MAC address too, but in that case, the dongle is what we're using to do the boot process, and so it does get in the way of OSD, right? And there's other examples with virtual machines I've seen with duplicated Macs. Again, shouldn't happen, but it does sometimes. So just know that there is sometimes the possibility of having duplicated Macs if you're not getting the response you expect, you might check for that, right? But anyway, we're looking at the device, uh, in NVS lookup device, uh, get Pixie boot action, right? What is our option, right? And so we pass in some more information and then we uh, go on through, right? Well, this works hand in hand and, and pretty much that's it, right? So I'll leave that for now. Um, this works hand in hand with a log on the server, the Pixie uh, or the system that has uh, the distribution point enabled for Pixie. So if we go into uh, the config manager directory, in my case, this is the site server, so it's tucked under here, and I look for SMS Pixie, right? This is the log that will track all of that information. So I can line it up with timestamps. It's probably a good idea to do, especially if you're trying to trace things and how they happen. But uh, just within this log, most people, you don't need to go to profile. The profiler I add just to show you, right? But if we do uh, the review of this log and do what we're supposed to do with logs and follow timestamps, we know that our discussion starts here from our latest boot. And you'll see that we're sending in, we don't have an IP address, you know, here's not my IP address, you know, here's my Mac though, right? And that different information that we're sending in, right? So we, we start to get that, we're going to post some of the stuff to the management point, there's a request here. Uh, here's our client lookup reply because we're trying to find you know, the client and so on, right? And then, so that was the first lookup, right? And then we see our client boot action. So we're in this process, we're looking at the client with that first stored procedure, then we're looking at the boot action. So we have to find out, is it a valid client, first of all? And if it is, is there something targeted to this system so we have the ability to Pixie boot and start to image, right? Here's the, uh, the Pixie, the uh, uh, boot action reply indicating you know, hey, yeah, we have a boot image. Here's the ID that we need. Uh, we're, here's our offer ID that we're going to send down. So the offer ID will be the deployment that is targeted to the machine. In fact, to, to prove that, notice that I have under software library uh, task sequences, here's uh, my deployments, right? And here's 2E. So this is one of my deployments. Uh, that is targeted to my machine that just booted up. So uh, to tie it all together, right? And then... Um, you know, we see another client boot action reply here as well, just kind of repeating that and so on. And then uh, eventually we'll, uh, we'll see the boot image, looking for the boot image, trying to find that. And then we start booting and send the report and so on, right? There's more detail here, but that gives you some of the framework on how this works. So you can track this whole thing through uh, this log. If we had unknown computer support enabled, you'd see some differences. If we don't find anything, you would definitely see some differences and so on, right? But that's how it works. Now, to complete the circle, let me just show you this. I'm going to go ahead and close the logs, uh, open up SQL for a minute. <clears throat> Management Studio. And there are actually four stored procedures that can be invoked in different scenarios for uh, Pixie or network boot services. So if we go down to programmability, stored procedures, and I go down to the NBS portion, 
here. Here we are. These are the four stored procedures. So we saw the git pixie action or lookup device, I think, then p git pixie boot action. These are two that we didn't see, but in some scenarios you might. All right, so all of that, now we understand, hopefully, uh, what we uh, can do in um, setting this thing up, right? So, cool. Now let's talk about the fun part, actually deploying this thing. You notice I'm not talking a lot about task sequencing and boot images and all of those things because those are common pieces across this. What I'm focusing on is Pixie and how we enable the Pixie services, how Pixie works to find that information out of our environment and so on, right? But we'll talk about a few deployment considerations here. So I've mentioned a couple of times that there are some things that can be risky with Pixie. Right? And for the reasons stated. So when you do your deployment, like with any deployment, you have the ability to configure a deployment to be required. In some cases, having a required deployment is very, very useful. In fact, on uh, the blog that I talk about, I think it's called the Sweet Spot of Imaging, Sweet S-U-I-T-E, right? I talk about a scenario where with orchestrator pairing with Config Manager and building virtual machines and so on, you need to have a required deployment setup that we can pull down. There are very good scenarios where having a required deployment is helpful. So I'm not dissuading you from doing that, but what I'm saying is if before you pull the trigger on a required deployment, you need to know what to expect and you need to have tested it and know what to do, right? Because uh, it can be risky. Why can it be risky? As cited, right? If the BIOS boot order is set for Pixie first and there's a required to deployment and it happens to match for that machine, we're just going to start loading. We are not going to stop. You've seen that already, right? Um, now, here's a piece of trivia for you, right? And one that I asked myself and I actually tested. So in some scenarios, I guess you could get into a place where you have more than one required deployment, right? Well, how does that work then? Well, let's look, right? In my lab, I have two required deployments. So let's kind of tie some things together. Uh, here. So I have two required deployments. I've got this deployment, right, right here, when we looked at uh, here, 2C, and I have this one, 2E. And they are both going to the same collection, Pixie Boot Demo, Pixie Boot Demo, and they are both required. Required. Now, in my case, these are the same task sequence. I just cloned it for the purpose of testing, right? But if you are in this scenario, the question is, what happens to the machine? Do you get stopped and then get asked which task sequence do you want? No, you don't. You've already seen in my lab that when I boot this thing, it just starts to load an image. Question is, which one? And my point in this is saying, if you have multiple deployed task sequences that are required to the same machine, then you're going to get maybe unpredictable results. Well, let's trace that. Let's be a little bit tedious maybe, but let's, let's trace that for a minute. So I have my machine uh, under here, assets and compliance. Let's go down to bare metal. And I want to make sure that nothing has run on this machine. Again, I'll talk on the, this more in just a minute. So I'm going to clear this. Again, make sure that I don't have any more. and I shouldn't, right? No, nothing there. So I'm totally clear. So let's boot this machine and find out which of these two task sequences we run or which of these two deployments we run, right? So I'm going to go ahead and say action start. And we'll let it boot. And then I'm going to go back to the SMS Pixie log that I showed you. And we're going to find out which one of these actually ran, right? So once I get done and get a boot started, then I'm going to go ahead and turn it off. Off, right? Now, uh, hopefully I'll let that process long enough. Let's, uh, let's see. Well, we'll wait. We'll see, right? So I may not catch this. Maybe I will. We'll try it. So I'll go into Program Files, uh, Config Manager, Logs, and back to that SMS Pixie. All right? Probably should have let it go longer, but we'll see. So following the timestamp, which is what we do, right? what we care about is knowing what uh, image we're going to load. And so we see that our offer ID is 2E. So we're going to load 2E. Right? The question is, are we going to load that offer ID the next time? And we might, we'll see, 
right? Let's uh, let me try it again. So I just booted. Let me start it again. Boot again. And we're going to load again. Let it do its thing. And now I'm going to let it go a little bit longer just in case. So I'll turn that off. All right, cool. And now let's look at the pixie log again. Uh, here. Notice now 2C, right? Why? Well, let's look and find out, right? So uh, basically, I have two deployments, one with an ID of 2E, one with an ID of 2C. They both loaded, but one was picked the first time and the other was picked the second time. The question is, why? Right? Well, if we go into the system, we'll see if it's there yet. Yeah, well, so basically, we keep a record of the systems that Pixie boot and so on. And, uh, you know, if it's already Pixie booted one way, we won't let it Pixie boot another way again. Right? And, and there's some some shuffle that might happen behind the scenes and so on. But nevertheless, once a system is flagged as having been pixie booted before, can't pixie boot it again, m unless, at least in my testing, there's another required deployment. And so you might get some interesting results. The point of this whole discussion is to say, if you're going to use required deployments, don't have more than one to the same machine because you're going to get different results, or at least you may, right? Depending. All right. So let's uh, uh, keep going. So certainly another way that we can do the deployment is to do available, right? That's the safer option. It's the way that we can do any of our deployments uh, required or safer. If you're learning OSD for the first time, getting used to this for Pixie, that is the way to go, right? Required could meet your needs down the road, but uh, getting familiar with it, use available, right? Then the unintended install. So you've you've seen I'm doing an un unattended install. I don't have to touch this. Yeah, I have to turn on the VM in my case, but uh, you could even automate that, right? So you could do a completely unattended install, right? Uh, maybe you have to power on the physical machine if it's a workstation, whatever, right? Uh, the question is, is that configurable? And the answer for Pixie is no, right? It is the way it works. If there's a required deployment, it is always going to run immediately. Now, it is configurable for other types of boot, uh, boot media, right? But it's not configurable for Pixie. In fact, we added in Config Manager 2012 this flag down here to say, hey, allow unattended operating system deployment. That wasn't here in 2007. So you could get the same effect as Pixie just with bootable media if you set that flag, right? And it won't stop, it just runs. So that's a difference between boot media and um, and Pixie, right? All right, and then the last thing, you've already seen me use it a couple of times. I've already explained it. But here, uh, if we go into bare metal, as an example, we have this thing called clear required Pixie. Now, we don't have any because you saw me clear it earlier, right? But the point of this is as we've said. So it's a safety valve. So if you have a system with a required, only required, available doesn't qualify, with a required deployment, then when we pixie boot that machine, we're going to set a flag in the database to say, this system just booted with this deployment. Don't let it go again, right? Why? Because if you have, for some reason, a system that boots, it images, no problem. Now it's in production for a couple of days, and there's a power outage or whatever, and the system gets rebooted or whatever. Now it's going to re-image again. And then if it happens later, it's going to re-image again. So this is safety, right? Once it's already pixie booted, we don't want it to be allowed to pixie boot again. If you need it to, then sure, you can go and clear this flag just like I showed you. Right now, uh, there was an interesting problem in Config Manager 2012 SP1 with this. So one of the things that customers who test OSD might do is, um, as they're testing, they might go in uh, into devices maybe and import your computer information. Okay, now it's in. Okay, we're going to pixie boot test this. Okay, now it pixie booted successfully. I need to clear it out again so that I can boot it again. And so they have a choice. They can either just simply go in and clear pixie. Uh, well, this is grayed out because I'm in uh, devices, but let's just go in here. They, you could go in here and uh, 
clear required Pixie deployments, and that would do it, and we can keep going. Or you might just have, a, as a habit, just go in here and delete the machine, right? If you delete the machine, it's gone from the console, and you would expect that you could Pixie boot the box again. Problem was you couldn't, right? The reason why is an SP1, we would not clear the tables that we needed to clear, or the table that we needed to clear whenever we simply deleted the machine. We would leave it there, and so we would uh, get into a problem situation that sometimes you'd have, or you'd have to go in and manually intervene, right? Now in R2, we have that problem handled. It's not a problem anymore at all, right? Okay, so enough about that. Now, just a couple of other tidbits as we kind of wrap up the session here. Let me get the lab out of the way again, get back to the PowerPoint. All right, so uh, there are some uh, considerations. You know, in any production environment, we're going to have, very likely, remote subnets. So there are two ways that you can support Pixie Boot across remote subnets. One is to use DHCP scope options. The other is to use this thing called IP helpers. It is not uncommon for customers to use DHCP scope options. Only challenge with that, they're not supported. Right? The only supported way to do it is IP helpers. It works with the scope options, but there can be some difficulties that you run into, and the IP helpers is uh, really what we support. If you want to understand how to configure IP helpers, uh, it's, it's not a config manager thing. It's a networking thing, right? And this is a 2007 uh, discussion, but it's the same kind of thing in 2012. So this is a good place to start. Uh, I didn't find a lot of discussion about configuring IP helpers on the web, but uh, if you have a networking person, they probably know how to do it. All right, but that's a good place to start. And then lastly, just talking about some Pixie issues. So a uh, couple of things, there's actually three I'll mention. Uh, temporary files issue in Config Manager 2007. So I showed you on the remote, rem uh, the remote install folder where the temporary files are in the SMS temp and the TMP for the, the base bare metal uh, or base uh, WDS, right? In 2007, I haven't seen it in 2012, haven't heard it reported in 2012, the temp files could lock up and they would uh, cause WDS not to be able to service any requests. So uh, you might have to reboot, you might have to clear them, you know, whatever. Again, I haven't seen it, you know, sometimes it was attributed to virus scanning being too frequent or whatever, but at least that was an issue in 2007. Again, haven't seen it in 2012, so that's good, right? Multiple NICs in routing. So Again, some systems might have multiple NICs. They might get confused which NIC is responding where and routing might get confused and so on. Shouldn't happen that much, but I've seen it in a couple of cases and so on. Then the third issue that I didn't put in the PowerPoint uh, that I'll mention is, frankly, with Surface, right? It could be others as well, but uh, one of the issues should be fixed in a firmware update, probably by the time uh, some of you watch this recording. But uh, there's a firmware update or a, a firmware problem where Surface will ask for a 32-bit boot image. It will identify itself as a 32-bit machine. Problem is, it's not a 32-bit machine, it's a 64-bit machine. And so whenever that boot image comes down, we provide the boot image that, that Surface asks for, but it won't run because it's a 64-bit machine. Now, that leads to another thing. Why won't a 32-bit image or a boot image run on a 64-bit Surface? Because 32-bit boot images will run just fine on a 64-bit PC other than, you know, Surface. Well, it's not really a Surface issue. It's more of a UEFI issue. In UEFI, your boot image has to match the architecture of your machine. So you cannot run a 32-bit boot image on a 64-bit box, right? That's, again, regardless if it's a PC and you're using UEFI, your boot image has to match the architecture. So, all right, so that really wraps up the discussion on Pixie and booting in Config Manager 2012. We will wrap the session for now, and we will see you next time.